Always. We ask the question. What is the question world? Poštovani gledalci, gost emisije recite Al Jazeera je Sami Hamdi, jedan od najistaknutijih političkih analitičara arapskog porijekla i direktor konsultanske firme The International Interest, koji nam se uključuje iz Londona. Sami, hello and welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel. Thank you so much for taking time to speak to us. Now, let me start by asking you, how do you perceive the latest Israeli aggression uh, on Gaza within the broader context uh, of the protracted Israeli blockade of the tiny strip of land? I think it's important to put it into context. Netanyahu was standing at the United Nations one week before October 7th, telling the United Nations or showing a map in which he had erased Palestine completely. And in the same breath, he was saying that normalization of ties with Saudi Arabia would be the greatest deal since the end of the Cold War. The Israeli ambassador to the UN told Cannes Television, the Israeli channel, that normalization of ties with Saudi Arabia would mean the complete, complete Arab abandonment uh, of the Palestinians. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan met Netanyahu for the first time in the United Nations, and the Israelis were taunting the Palestinians with the picture to show that even what they perceived to be the last bastion or the mm -hmm. last advocate for the Palestinian cause was now seeking warmer ties with Israel. There was a sense, at least even amongst the ordinary street, that the Palestinian cause was somewhat dying, or at least it was significant deflated and that Netanyahu would proceed ahead with normalization of Saudi Arabia and start to annex the West Bank or the like. The reason that context is important is because it highlights why Israel is so aggressively attacking Gaza. To mount the most potent attack on Israel since 1948, at a time in which the Palestinians were supposed to be at their weakest, has caused such a concern in Tel Aviv and such a concern with Netanyahu that one of the reasons that he wants to demolish Gaza is not to demolish Gaza as a city, but to demolish this idea that the Palestinian cause is still alive and that the Palestinians still have agency, especially when you consider that the overwhelming narrative now amongst the analysts and policy makers are that this was brought about by the failure to engage the Palestinians with normalization processes. Well, King Abdullah of Jordan said you can't just fly over the head of the Palestinians and normalize at their expense. There is a change in narrative, a change in global public opinion towards what's happening. And it's in this context that the Israeli aggression is so fierce this time. And the final point that's worth noting here in this is that the other reason why it's so fierce is not because Israel believes that its interests are at stake, but that Netanyahu believes his political future is at stake. When you look at Israeli polls, there is an overwhelming sentiment that Netanyahu is to blame before Hamas, and that it, this is all Netanyahu's fault. And there is a concern in Netanyahu and his team that if they stop the war now, they will have to face the Israeli public that is calling for Netanyahu's resignation. And that's why it's his own interest, not Israel's, to continue this war until he provides some sort of victory where he might be able to convince the Israelis to let him stay in power. Right. So is Israel fighting Hamas as, it's, as it claims, or is it fighting the Palestinian nation as a whole? I think that the Israelis themselves are not sure what exactly they are they are fighting at this moment in time. I think that even when you look at the delay in the ground offensive, a lot of the reason for the delay is because the Israelis have no idea who exactly they're fighting, who they should be fighting, and what they should achieve in the first place. They say that they are fighting Hamas, but there is a consensus even in Washington and in Tel Aviv that even if they wipe out Hamas, the environment in which Hamas emerged from still remains intact. Right. If the issue is about annexation in the West Bank or the like, Biden has come out and said that the escalation in the West Bank has to stop immediately, suggesting that the Americans might be supporting the Israelis in Gaza, but they're not supporting in the West Bank. So if you imagine yourself in the, in the Israeli war room, it's unclear what it is exactly you're trying to achieve as far as Israel as a state is concerned. And this is why I think the issue is less about Israel versus Hamas or Israel versus the Palestinians and much more about Netanyahu versus the Palestinians. Palestinians and the Israelis who want him uh, to resign. And I think that's why in this context, when people are scenario planning or trying to see what happens next, the reason there's so much gray and not enough clarity over what happens next is because no one is able to identify the real aims of what Israel wants to achieve. Right. So has this attack, uh, in, in, attack in some way helped Netanyahu politically stay alive? I think that it's a double-edged sword. I think Netanyahu knows that if the war ends, he's most likely going to be forced to resign. 
So, and this is why Netanyahu wants the war to continue. But even if the war continues, it's hard to imagine what Netanyahu can offer to the Israelis in order for them to allow him to stay in power. One suggestion being touted is that Netanyahu wants to empty northern Gaza, annex Gaza, and then hand it to a new batch of Israeli settlers, a sort of land for staying in power deal that he will offer to the Israelis. The issue, of course, is that that requires a ground offensive that the Israelis are not sure that they're capable uh, of fulfilling, given that they've tried in the past to do ground offensives and, and they haven't succeeded. So I think that Netanyahu knows that ending the war will certainly result in being forced to resign, and therefore there's a need to continue the war. But even then, I think Netanyahu is not clear what a scenario looks like in which a war ends and he's able to stay in power. He's not sure what it is he has to offer the Israelis in order to stay in power. And I think it was very noteworthy and interesting that the Times of Israel reported that the IDF and Netanyahu are frustrated that hostages are being released by Hamas because they're concerned that releasing hostages will accelerate the end of the war and end of a de-escalation. And that would explain why Netanyahu has been bombing Gaza and killing Israeli hostages in the process. And it would also explain why the hostages' families in Israel are very angry with Netanyahu. Netanyahu hasn't attended any funeral for any of the hostages because he's very wary that the families of the hostages will lambast him for what has happened. Netanyahu wants the war to continue, but even then, he's not sure if that will rescue him. Right. Now, let's move on to how this war is perceived in the West. I mean, uh, in, your, in your opinion, to what extent do you believe have Western media narratives influenced, um, uh, you know, the global perception of the ongoing, uh, you know, war uh, against the Palestinians? And in, in your case, you live, in, you live in London. How does British media um, portray this, uh, this conflict in Gaza? I think that the Western media narratives have been the u uh, they have been the usual in the beginning of the of October seventh. It was this idea that the Israelis have a right to self defense and the Palestinians are terrorists who are attacking Israel or the like. But I think there has been a notable change in the coverage. For example, we saw that although CNN and BBC went with the issue of went went with the talk of the forty beheaded babies that Israel had spread as fake news. We saw Sky News coming out and saying that we're not going to cover it because there's no proof and no evidence for it either. Mm -hmm. We've seen BBC presenters apologize for their coverage and apologize for falling below journalistic standards. That's unprecedented, and that's as a result of social media and the public pressure from there. CNN presenter apologized herself as well for giving wall-to-wall -wall coverage to the news of the 40 beheaded babies. This is unprecedented with regards to Western media, and it indicates that Although there is a propagation of the same narratives that we've seen before, we're beginning to see changes in the way that narrative is being presented because they are buckling under the public pressure. And you'll note even the Piers Morgan show, Piers Morgan is under significant pressure, but Piers Morgan is giving unprecedented access for Palestinian voices on the show. And mm -hmm. when he notices that the, his, he's getting millions of views when the Palestinian guests are present, that in itself is an indication that far more of public opinion resonate with the Palestinian opinion than they do with the Israeli opinion. And that's why we're seeing a lot of pressure from the Israelis on social media to uh, clamp down on pro-Palestinian narrative. It's why we've seen Keir Starmer, the leader of the opposition of the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, roll back on his statement that Israel is allowed to cut off electricity and water to Gaza. The point being is, although Western media is following the same script as it always has, it's beginning to buckle and it's beginning to change its tune, albeit slightly, as a result of social media and as a result of the public pressure. Right. Despite social media such as Facebook and, and YouTube blocking certain content, uh, which has, which of course promotes uh, or gives gives sp space to a Palestinian voice. You still say that um, the Arab voice in general is making it slowly into the mainstream. I think that there was a YouGov poll, which is the most prominent pollster mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom, which uh, produced a poll about four uh, last week, based on when the viewers will see this. Uh, last week, in which the, the YouGov poll said that 76% of Britons, of citizens of the United Kingdom, are in favor of an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. That's unprecedented. In the US, a poll came out, a Gallup poll, that suggested that at least 60% of Americans are in favor of an immediate ceasefire. That's unprecedented. Moreover, while we talk about the algorithms or the like, if you, if you watch the video of uh, Ron DeSantis at the supermarket talking with American citizens, the American citizens reject his argument 
argument that Israel has a right to self-defense. And the reason they're rejecting that the citizens are saying is because they've seen the reality of what's taking place in Gaza, in that Israel is telling the world what is happening, but Palestinians are showing the world what is happening. And that suggests that despite the restrictions that social media is trying to put on pro-Palestinian content, it's still reaching the masses and still reaching the people. And one thing worth noting here is that X or Twitter or call it whatever you wish, doesn't actually impose the same restrictions right. that Facebook and Instagram have mm -hmm. been imposing. And I think that's been the main area through which the war of narratives is being won and actually changing opinions and allowing for greater representation of the pro-Palestinian cause in a manner that is making Israel very uncomfortable. Right. Now, Sami, um, uh, how has the so-called normalization process between Arab states and Israel uh, impacted the Arab world's support for Palestinians, or has it impacted it at all? What does the Arab street say today about uh, the Palestinian cause? I think that one thing that's worth noting is normalization never takes place in a democracy. It's, it's reliant on, on regimes that do not necessarily represent their people. Right. The reason why I mention that is because although there is huge public anger on the streets and although we're seeing people protesting, we're also seeing countries such as Saudi Arabia give clear indications that they want to keep the normalization process uh, alive. We saw Jared Kushner, who was the architect of the so-called deal of the century, speaking at the Davos Forum. We've seen, for example, that uh, many Saudi commentators are attacking Palestinians and propagating the narrative that this is all the Palestinians' fault. We're seeing that the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in the, in the Riyadh summit with the ASEAN countries last week, he gave a speech of five minutes and dedicated 32 seconds to Gaza. He didn't call it a war. He called it an unfortunate violence. He didn't mention Israel by name, nor did he condemn Israel for what it's doing in Gaza either, suggesting that the message coming out of Saudi Arabia is that we don't want to cause, we don't want to be involved in this, and it will not jeopardize the normalization process. And I think that's why the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the U.S. Senate even suggested that Saudi Arabia will not compromise normalization because normalization for Saudi Arabia is about pushing back against Iran. I think that for the UAE, there are signs that it's uncomfortable. We've seen the UAE allow its commentators to run wild in their criticism of Israel. We've seen the UAE cancel uh, some of events and festivals and the like uh, in favor of Gaza. But we haven't seen any reversal of normalization of ties. Saudi Arabia hasn't shut down its airspace uh, to the Israelis. It's If you look at the media in some of these countries, like Saudi Arabia, if you look at the Uqav newspaper, which is the national newspaper, right. th uh, three quarters of the page is about economic development with only one quarter about Gaza. So the suggestion is that normalization is paused, but it has it, but it's not finished. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, considering the, the intricate web of lobbying and pressure groups operating in Europe, in the UK, in the US, um, how do you evaluate uh, the effectiveness, effectiveness of Israeli pressure groups in shaping the foreign policy uh, discourse and the decisions in these, in these countries regarding the Palestinian issue. And in your case, I mean, are you under any sort of pressure because of your analysis and your views? I think there's a lot of, I think what we can safely say is there is a battle taking place in the academic sphere, the journalistic sphere, the corporate world. Uh, we've seen instances of people being sacked, being canceled mm -hmm. for expressing support for the Palestinians. At the same time, however, we are seeing that that is not stemming the wave of pro-Palestinian sentiment that is being expressed by the institutions. And you'll note the 2,000 uh, actors and actresses who signed an open letter in the UK calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, something that's also very much unprecedented. There certainly is pressure. However, I think that given the manner in which everybody is promoting the Palestinian cause, given the manner in which it's been, it's the main topic and still is the main topic three weeks into the events that have taken place. I think that the loudness of the Palestinian content is drowning out the Israeli narrative, which is making it very difficult for the Israeli lobby to be able to punish everybody. In the words of uh, the former Facebook director for North Africa, the algorithms are being so overwhelmed that they can't keep up with the people who are uh, promoting the pro-Palestinian content uh, or the like. There certainly is pressure, but I think the consequences of that pressure are not what they have been in the past. We can say or we can say safely say that this is a watershed moment in Israel's 
uh, ability to control the narrative. And I argue that Israel's monopoly now has been broken, and I don't think Israel will ever be able to restore that again. Now, Sami, when you say there's a, there's been a recent wave of pro-Palestinian sentiment uh, among certain segments of of the Western public, of course, this is this is a notable shift in in Western public opinion. But I was wondering, uh, who spearheads these? pro-Palestinian pro protests in, in Europe. Are we talking about second or third generation Muslim migrants or not? There is, I think that the Israelis have sought to suggest that it is mainly Muslim migrants or, or, or the descendants of Muslim migrants. But the reality is when you go to these protests, you see a lot of the native population. By native, I mean those who are English, those who are American, those right. who are French, those who are Rome, those who have been exposed to the pro-Palestinian content and who openly say that for their entire lives they believe the Israeli narrative and suddenly they feel like they've woken up to the reality of the situation of what has taken place. And that's why I think that the, the where Israel is struggling is that the protest that we see uh, in France, in Rome, in Berlin, the the when France tries to ban protest or the like, the people taken to the streets are the likes of Jeremy Corbyn, are the likes of other uh, allies that are not necessarily from the region or the like, who are making loud and clear that they want to cease for. And I think this is where there is deep concern for the Israeli narrative, in that those now who are being convinced of the Palestinian narrative are not those who are already convinced, but that neutrals who always tended to be sympathetic to the Israelis are now changing their minds. And that's unprecedented. And that, I think, will be the greatest victory that the Palestinians will achieve, irrespective of the scenarios that might unfold later. And I think that if Netanyahu could choose between keeping the monopoly over the narrative or destroying Gaza, he would choose keeping the monopoly on the narrative. And that's why I think even if he flattens Gaza, and God forbid that he does, but even if he flattens Gaza, he will walk away from this with a body blow that he will not be able to recover from nor will the Israeli control of the narrative be able to recover from. Now, Sami, uh, perhaps I should have asked you earlier, but how do you, you expect Ankara um, to react towards uh, the ongoing Israeli aggression against Gaza? We've seen some rather cautious uh, responses. Of course, uh, AKP has always been uh, very supportive of the Palestinians. Um, we know they took them almost a decade to normalize ties. We talked about Israel and, and Turkey. Um, uh, what do you expect from Ankara in the next weeks? I think that when it comes to Turkey's relations with Israel, it's important to remember that the reason Erdogan cut ties with Israel or, or withdrew the ambassador and kicked out the Israeli ambassador mm -hmm was not because of anything the Israelis did to the Palestinians. It was because the Israelis attacked the Turkish flotilla and killed nine Turks. Erdogan lashed out at Israel when the Turks were killed, not when the Palestinians were killed. And I think that even now, the Turkish position is one in which Erdogan doesn't want to go too far with the Israelis. And even the latest statements that he's made, which are very aggressive towards the Israelis, I think that those statements are more geared towards a very angry Turkish population who are demanding that Erdogan take a stance and Erdogan trying to balance between not offending the Israelis while not alienating his base who see him as an Islamic figure who should be standing up for these issues. So I think that for Ankara, if the question is what is Ankara doing, I think Ankara is quietly praying that all of this goes away very quickly so that it can focus on its immediate economic issues. If it's about what Ankara should do, I think that Erdogan has demonstrated a capability in the past of strong arming Washington into making concessions on Syria or on Russia or the like. I think Erdogan has the power to do so with regards to uh, Gaza and Palestine. There are measures that Erdogan could take, such as summoning the U.S. ambassador or even uh, threatening to cut ties with Israel again. Three weeks into the conflict and the massacres, he still hasn't done so. And I think the message that Tel Aviv at least feels is coming from Ankara is that Erdogan's speeches are geared towards the Turks and the Muslim world. They're not geared towards us, in that, given that Erdogan wants to maintain those ties. That's difficult for me to say, but I think that's, that's my take at least on Ankara's position at the moment. Right. And finally, um, we've seen a number of you know, initiatives coming from Secretary Blinken, from uh, Minister Fidan, from the Qatari Min uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, when it comes to try attempting to, uh, you know, to come up with a, with a ceasefire at least. Um, who among all these can play the role of an honest broker? We know that, that the U.S. has for years been giving Israel the carte blanche and can no longer be considered an honest broker. Can uh, Qatar or Turkey uh, take over this role? 
I think that Qatar has been the most effective broker in all of this that has that, that, that has played out. Al Jazeera has been absolutely phenomenal in the way that it has delivered the Palestinian narrative, in the way it has pushed back against the Israeli narratives, the way that Al Jazeera journalists have covered this issue relentlessly and been an alternative source of news for what's happening in Palestine in a way that CNN, BBC refused to cover or refused to propagate. And that's why Blinken went to the Qataris and asked Al Jazeera to tone it down. I think the Qataris also, their ability to communicate with Hamas and the Israelis, Blinken himself has said that he celebrates Qatar's role in its efforts to release the hostages or the like. I think Qatar on its own is capable of maintaining the dialogue channels that will, will at least help to encourage a delay in the ground offensive. But I think that uh, the reality is that if you look at 1973, when the Israelis were marching into Egypt and Syria, what stopped it was a collective Arab stance of an oil embargo. I'm not saying oil embargo is needed now, but I'm saying right. the collective stance in the Muslim world that forced the Americans into a panic that sent them rushing to Tel Aviv to tell the Israelis to back down. Right, What's Sammy, that, that was the is, last time. That was the last time the Arab world had a common stance. Exactly. And I think that when you're talking about, you know, what powers can individual states could do, I think individually their powers are limited. But collectively, if they take a stance, I do think the Americans will panic. And I think that Blinken, one of the reasons that he did his regional tour was to try to find out the extent to which the regional powers would be willing to commit to a collective stance. And he went back to Washington satisfied that Saudi is not interested, UAE is not interested, and CC is isolated in, in, in the, with the issue of the Rafah crossing, and Qatar is operating by itself, and Erdogan is, doesn't really want an all-out conflict with the Israelis either. So I think that in terms of what they can do, the possibilities are there. Will they do it? I think that given the individual interests, they're not doing it. However, I do think, and, and it's worth finishing on this note, that the changes in the stances of the regimes is happening because of public opinion. There is an acute awareness that if the regimes are seen to be against public opinion, these public protests could turn into a new Arab Spring. And that's why I think that we're seeing a shifting in stance. It may be slow, but I think as long as public opinion continues to be loud, I think eventually the regimes will find themselves forced to mobilize and try to strong arm Washington into bringing a resolution to this whole conflict. Right. Sami, it was such a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much once again for your time. Thank you very much for having me.